What's up everyone, today I'm redoing one of my earliest YouTube videos where I talk about some PowerShell tips and tricks to get you started if you're a beginner or just learning PowerShell. And maybe even if you're a veteran and been using it for a while, you might learn something anew about the language that you just didn't know was there before. As always, this code is available out in my GitHub repository. I'll include a link to it down in the video description. My name is Jeff. This is Jeff Brown Tech. Let's go ahead and get started. Usually the first commandlet you might show someone new to PowerShell is the git help commandlet. You can use this to find more information about a command and potentially how to use it if you're not sure what it's looking for, what you need in order to run it. You can get started with this commandlet by using git help and then the name parameter and put in the name of the commandlet or command that you want to learn more about. In this case, we're going to take a look at set local user. Maybe I don't know what this command does or how I can use it. If we execute this, let's go back up. It's going to tell me the name of the commandlet, a brief synopsis. It modifies a local user account. We have a couple of groupings here of syntax. This just means this commandlet uses parameter sets, and there are different parameters you can use in different scenarios. If you don't know what parameter sets are, I do have a video about that. I'll include a link to it down in the video description. We then have a description of the commandlet, just as it sets a local user account. It can also reset the password of a local user account. We have some related links. We can go online and learn more about it. I'll show you a quick way on how to access that online help if you're interested. And then down here under remarks, we have additional information on if we want to see examples, detailed, full documentation, or this is the one I was just talking about. We can run git help and do dash online. It'll take us to online help if it is available. Let's take a look at a couple of these in action. If we were to run detailed git help, we can scroll back through and it'll go through each parameter and show us what type of data type it's looking for and some additional information. You know, account expires, you're specifying when the user account expires, giving a description, maybe setting the account that never expires, etc. You do then have the option to look at full help information. One of my favorites is just running examples. So you can take a look at some examples of how to use the commandlet. In this case, here's example one. We're taking a look at, we're just giving it a name and a description. And example two shows you how to change the password of, on an account. So examples are great if you just need a specific scenario on how to use it. For in this case, you know, resetting the password on the account. And we have Dash Online already mentioned. If you run this one, it'll open your web browser and take you out to online documentation. It's available. As we've seen here, as you're running this Git help, it is displaying the information right here in the browser. And maybe you don't want to scroll up and down and go, you know, what parameters are looking for, taking a look at this example, everything, because you're trying to use the commandlet right then. One option you do have is to use the show window parameter. Let's go ahead and execute this. And what this will do is open up the help text in another window. Here we have our help in another window. You can just set this to the side. You can expand this and take a look at all the information right here and then go back over to your window over here and start building your commandlet as needed has a search option, got a couple of settings here. What do we have here? Oh yeah, different help sections uh, and a few search options here. Just some really basic information, but if you want your information or the help text up in another window, show window is really awesome to use. Now, another thing, if you're trying to find out more information about a commandlet or how it's used, another option is using show command instead of git help. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Show command will bring up a window here of how to use the commandlet itself. Each of these tabs represent the different parameter sets I was talking about earlier. Let's say you're going to just give the name of the count and we have an asterisk here to show that this is a required field. And as you just saw, I can hover over it. It'll show me that it's mandatory. It can receive value from the pipeline. It's expecting a string value. So I can put in a name. Let's just say my local account. We can put in a time when the account would expire. Maybe it never expires. Description, full name. And then we have common parameters that are available to all commandlets. Error action, if you want to do progress, anything else like that. Or go through and take a look at looking input object or putting in a security identifier. These are our different parameter sets, as I mentioned. So this is really great. You can sit here if you don't want to type out on the command line itself of what it looks like, or if you want to see all parameters that are available. Show window is really cool. And then you have two different options here. You can just go ahead and run this command or you can copy it. And let's go ahead and cancel out. And if I come back here and do paste, it's built the command for me. You can see set local user name, my local user account, 
and then I can just run it as needed. Another helpful commandlet is running git history. You can view your previous commands in case you don't remember a command that you ran earlier. I believe this is limited to your current console. So if you close out the window and then reopen it, it may not have your full history. But if we run this, we can see here, I just ran clear screen a second ago and I ran show command and git help. And I was doing a couple other things inside of this window before I got started recording the video. When you get into writing your own scripts and functions, one of the things PowerShell has is approved verbs. As we've noticed so far, if you didn't know this about PowerShell, it's very much a verb dash noun format, and it's very descriptive on what that command is going to do. In this case, we're getting verbs, we're getting history, we're showing commands. The command names are very explicit in what they do. And PowerShell does have a list of approved verbs, so you can actually run the commandlet get verb, and it'll show you what verbs are available that you can use in your scripts and functions when you start to write them. Whenever I go to write my own scripts or functions, I'll usually jump out here, and if I have a verb in mind, I'll make sure it's in this list and use it in my custom scripts and functions. Now your PowerShell commands have versions, and those come from modules that are installed on your system, or maybe they're already included. And if needed, sometimes those commandlets are updated and you need to see what version you're on or you need to update to a new version. You can easily find out more information about a commandlet or command using git command. And you can put in the name of the commandlet you want more information about. So if I run this, we can see that this is a commandlet. It's version one and it's the source module is Microsoft PowerShell local accounts. That's just one that is included in my system. I didn't have to download it or anything there. But you can use git command to find other commandlets that you might be interested. For example, we're running git command. Maybe I want to know how to set a local user account or find other commandlets associated with setting users. I can use the name parameter here and set dash and then put wildcards around user. So if I were to run this, it gives me anything that has set and user inside of it. I have commandlets here from Azure PowerShell modules or the Microsoft Graph modules. You can also search on verbs. So if I want to find anything that's invoke, brings back a whole list of them here, invoke history, invoke expression, invoke command. And just continuing on, you can search for specific nouns. Let's find all the ones associated with local user. I can disable, enable, get new, remove, rename, or set a local user. Again, you can use wildcards with your nouns or your verbs. And then you can also find all the commands associated with this specific module. In this case, the AZ accounts module. Let's take a look at what's included in here. I can register an AZ module, get my AZ subscription, everything like that. Git command is just great. If you need to find information about what version you're using, find other commandlets that might be related to something that you're looking for or writing a script or need to use in your daily work. One of the things you'll occasionally come across inside of PowerShell is there are aliases for commands you might use, and they don't follow the verb dash noun format. If you ever come across one of these and you're not sure what the full commandlet is, you can use get alias and put in the name of the alias that you want more information about. In this case, we're looking at select. That's an alias for select object. Where is an alias for where object? For each is for each object. You might even come across symbols or special characters and wonder what they are. The percent sign is one for for each object also. These are just some of the major ones I've come across. Format listing, GM is git member. We'll talk about git member a little bit later. And earlier I ran git history to look at my history, but actually if I'm just working in my console, I usually just run history because that's also an alias for it. A little bit fewer keystrokes you have to use there. In general, the best practices and recommendations if you're writing your own custom functions or scripts is to use the full commandlet names and not use these aliases because these aliases could change or maybe they might be deprecated. Highly unlikely, probably, but it could happen. But if you're ever looking at someone else's scripts or functions and they use an alias and you're not sure what that full commandlet is, again, just use this right here and you'll figure out what the full command is. And also these are great if you're just working daily in the console and need to look at something, go ahead and use aliases all you want. It's just when you go to write your own stuff, use the full commandlet name. One of the next commandlets to take a look at is select object. You can use this to limit the number of returned results in something that you're taking a look at. In this example, we're running git process, so show all the running processes on my system. 
we're going to pipe this over to select object and use the first parameter to just bring back the first result that it gives me. I'm running this and saving it to the first process variable. And then if I run first process, it only returns one. Maybe I want the first 10. That'll give me the first 10 processes. And then there's also ones for the last five. So it'll give you the last five in there that are returned when running get process. Again, select object, just a little bit of a filtering there to only return a certain number of results. Next, let's talk about what makes PowerShell really great in comparison to tools that we used to have inside of Windows. And I literally say the power of PowerShell is everything is an object. And what I mean by that is this allows you to use information and data and manipulate it very easily in comparison to other command line options we've had in the past. An object is an instance of a .NET class, meaning it has properties and methods that can be accessed and manipulated. What do we mean by everything's an object and how is this better than other command line interfaces we maybe had in the past? An example would be, let's say you've run IP config and it returns back some information about the IP configuration of my system here. But this is just a string inside the console here. If I wanted to return just the IP address, I would not be able to do this without doing a lot of string slicing and everything. And it was just super complicated in order to make that happen. And then if this output changed in any way, it would mess up what you were doing and trying to pull out just this little specific IP address. Instead, we can run a PowerShell command and just pull back out saying, hey, just give me that IP address. We'll take a look at some examples of what that looks like. Let's start very basic, though. Let's define a variable called string. It's named dollar sign string and it's going to say hello world. And what we mean by this object here of our variable has properties and methods is you can access those and not have to write any additional code to do it. In this case, we're going to look at our variable string and do dot get type and close parentheses. Get type is a method available on string objects and lots of other data types. And if I run this, it'll just return back that the type of object that I'm working with here is a string. And then there's other methods here. I can get the length of the string, how many characters are, are included in it. We can see right there it's 13. And you can do other data manipulation with it without writing any additional code. Two upper means it'll put it in all capital letters. So if I run to that, it'll just automatically do it there for me. Now, how do you know what properties and methods are available on our different objects and data types? You can use the get member commandlet to do this. For example, let's run git process. It's going to return all the processes running on my system, but then we can view what properties and methods are available on it. So let's run that. And we can see a couple of different things here. We have the process name, that's a property. It's session ID, that's a property. You know, what container, or exit code, exit time, anything like that. And then we have a couple of different methods that are associated with Git process. And we saw this a little bit earlier. Normally I pipe it over to GM, which is an alias for a Git member. Let's take a look at some specific properties that are included with processes. Going back here, we have our first process where I ran Git process and just selected the first one from my results. So that's where my variable is coming back into play. So the first process dot name, the name of that parameter is accessory center container at main, whatever that is. Then you can also look at other properties of what the command line is when it's running and maybe the process ID. Just lots of great information that's built in. We saw an example earlier of some methods of saying, you know, to upper, it turned my string into uppercase. Let's take a look at some other examples here. I'm creating a variable called my string, and it says here is my string. You'll notice there is some white space characters here at the beginning and end of it. So let's bring this into our current session. We'll run my string get member. We'll take a look at some methods that are included with strings. We can do the to upper. We've already saw that. We can switch it to a Boolean value or a char array, anything like that. One method here, this is why I included the white space in it, is you can trim the white space at the beginning and end of a string. You can see when we ran that, it got rid of the white space at the beginning and the end of the string. Hard to tell at the end of the string, but you can definitely see here at the beginning. You can do word replacement. So I can say, replace the word my with your. We'll run this method here and it says, here is your string. 
Notice when we're running these though, it's only just outputting the result to the console here. You can see here it didn't save the trim that we did on the string because it's still just referring to the original string. You have to replace or create a new variable if you want these changes to modify the original value. We're just not doing that right now. We're just taking a look at the properties and everything in methods. Another method is splitting a string and you put in what you want to split it on. In this case, I want to split it on spaces within the string. So if we were to run that, you can see it outputs an array and outputs each word in the string on its own line. Talking about methods and properties and PowerShell objects and how all that works is, you know, usually a much bigger topic. Just wanted to do a quick introduction here on how you can run get member against a variable or a data type and see some of the built-in things that are available with it that you don't have to go and figure out how to write yourself potentially. Another helpful commandlet is sort object. What you can do is use this to sort results that you might get from a commandlet. In this case, let's run get process again. We're going to pipe this over to sort object. We're going to sort it in descending order based on the CPU value or the CPU percentage that it's using. So I can run this and if we scroll all the way back up, quite a long list of processes running right here. But if we get back up to the top, we can see CPU and the highest value is Camtasia. That's what I'm using to record this right now. So of course it's taking up the most processor power. And you can do additional things on it just saying, hey, let's use the top parameter to give me the top 10 results so I can see just the top 10 processes that are using the most CPU right now. Now we've already seen examples of this next thing of the pipe symbol, but let's go into a little bit more detail of what it's actually doing. You can use the pipe symbol here to pass results or objects to another command. For example, going back to line 95, we're running get process. It's getting all the results to get process and then sending it over to the sort object commandlet in order for it to continue working on those results. The pipe symbol allows you to chain different commands together in order to complete complex operations. And this is also, again, what's really great about PowerShell. For example, I could run get process. And if there's a specific process I wanted to terminate, I could use additional parameters with get process, maybe find it based on process ID or the name, and then pass that over to stop process. Just in case you didn't know what the pipe symbol was doing there, it just allows you to take all those results from a command and pass it to another command through the pipeline to continue working with those results. For example, let's continue with get process and where object. We're running get process. It's going to get all my processes. Then we're going to use where object to filter the results. In this case, I want to find processes where the name is like MS Edge. So I did MS Edge and a wildcard. Here we can see how many processes I have running that match that name. And then you can continue building commands using the pipeline. So in this case, we're running git process. We're using where object to filter out based on the name and then passing those results over to sort object. And we're going to look at it descending CPU time. So if I were to run this last one, all the process names start with MS Edge and it's filtering it down by how much CPU it's using. That is it for this video. If you're new to PowerShell, hopefully you learned something here that might help you in your daily work. Little things like knowing methods and properties or knowing you can use the pipe symbol to chain commands together, sort object, where object, getting help, all that fun stuff. And if you're a veteran PowerShell user, what tips would you have for a new beginner? That'd be awesome if you left a comment down below and helped out other people that might be watching this video. Anyway, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.